All right, we're back. And uh, honestly, I'm not going to lie. I forgot the last thing we were talking about. But um, <laughs> I have some notes. Actually, no, I do remember. So it goes back to the whole thing, I think, that you're talking about, like seeking pain, seeking greatness as opposed to happiness. I also agree. The whole idea of the pursuit of happiness, it sounds, oh, great, you know, this romantic idea is so great. But it's like... It's a con. It is. It <laughs> is a, a con. It's a con. And I'll tell you why it's a con. Like, you've ever watched... Um, I, I thought of this... Actually, I wrote this down, like, way before when we were talking about Musk. But uh, you've ever seen Whiplash? Yeah, I have actually. Yeah, so I fucking love that movie. And the thing I hate the most about people who watch that movie is they'll say, oh, you shouldn't take this movie literally. He actually lost in the end. Blah, 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 blah. No, dude, greatness is comes at a price. And it comes at the ultimate price. I don't give a fuck about happiness, this or that. No, greatness comes above all things. And at the very end of the movie, or no, no sorry, uh, in the middle of the movie, he has this conversation at dinner where um, they're, like, debating him about greatness and shit. And there's, like, you know, Buddy Rich, or fuck, what was his name? The drummer. Um, what is he Hold No Pages? Charlie. Yeah, Charlie. 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 Some, somebody. Anyway, that, that really famous drummer, um, fucking uh, the, at the dinner table, they're like, oh, yeah, he died third at 30, friendless, and OD'd on heroin or whatever. And, like, sure, don't OD on heroin. But, you know, he's one of the greatest drummers of all time. And, uh, the you know Miles Teller's character says, "I'd rather be thirty, friendless and dead, but but you know be great than ha- be ninety, rich and have friends, right?" And people like will repost Same. the meme of that, or not meme, but you know like the they'll repost the pictures of like the captions from that, and everyone in the comments is like, "No, that's so toxic. No, how I would totally be ninety and have friends and stuff and rich and blah blah." I'm like, "You guys are the most pathetic fucks ever. This is why the West is falling. This is why everything's falling. Is because we should be able to risk everything for greatness. And like, if you told me I could be like fucking Muhammad Ali type boxer or like fucking Conor McGregor minus the bad shit, but I die at thirty five. Or fuck that. Like, just anything great. Like, if you told me I could be great, I could fucking be like Alexander and conquer everything at 32. I could do this or that, but it means I die young. I'm taking that every fucking day. Greatness comes before everything else. Having an impact on history, propelling man to that sort of collective transcendence where we reach that ascension to godhood or whatever the fuck. Everything should be risked for that. And all this bullshit comfort just sickens me, you know? I mean, it sickens most people throughout history. Mm-hmm. I mean, to be frank with you, I, I I say I say this on the internet just to rile up the boys and and piss off the you know the normies that sh- you know follow me from time to time. Yeah. But I say this. I I I, I think I said this and I deleted it. I, I delete a lot of stuff after a time. You know what I mean? But <laughs> like, um, I say I said uh, what did I say exactly? I said oh I said. I hope I die before I'm too old, and I hope so, so that way I can bring with me my beautiful body to Elysium. Mm, and of Nisha course, Nipil. of course, of course, that brings you know a, a whole diatribe of people freaking trying to like dunk on me and whatever, and they just make themselves out to be cowards. Yeah, really, it just amounts to cowardice fundamentally, um, and it, it just shows me that you're not really living. Uh, if you want more of life, I, I think that's something that people really don't get psychologically. Luckily, I, I love psychology, but one of the biggest insights into psychology is those that are hypochondriacs that fear losing their life. They're not mm-hmm. fear losing their life per se. They want to not die because they fear they have never lived. Mm. And that dynamic is so big nowadays. There's a reason why everyone wants to live forever nowadays when in the past that they didn't is because of the fact that today no one lives. I mean, mm-hmm. even you and I who went to the military, did we really live like really, really like, did we like experience the same things that truly like mean what life means to men like us? Mm-hmm. I don't think so. I mean, to, I'll speak for myself. I yeah. don't think so. Um, and that's that's what Mishima was getting at. Yeah. It's basically, we've been relegated to the level of a cog. I mean, you know the idea from the Industrial Revolution, the universal, universal parts? They've just transposed that to humans, and mm. they've said, oh, you human being, you're just a universal part now. Yes. And uh, that is the most frightening 
like in- insightful and-, and frightening thing to have ever experienced in our lives is the mm-hmm. fact that we are just a cog. Yeah. And that's why office, uh, not office space, but that is important too. Um, Fight Club is so mm, important. Yes. It's because it talks exactly about this, that mm-hmm. even the military at this point has become office space. It yeah. has become a bureaucracy, which is mm-hmm. so disgusting. Um, and I remember feeling disgusted, in, especially in the officer class. Like these people, mm-hmm. they make paperwork so that way they can feel like they are their their betters in their their eyes. Like they can feel like they're bureaucrats, mm-hmm. you know. Like they can feel like they're doing real work because yeah. they have paperwork. You see, um, and that's like the most disgusting thing any officer or a true warrior would ever feel like paperwork is for mandarins it's for disgusting like bureaucrats people like okay sheriff of nottingham was actually the hero of robin hood i'll tell you that <laughs> you know peasants deserve to have a cane between their eyes okay this is disgusting to me because um i think that's something that's awry in the military is this aristocratic contempt mm-hmm. of a lower life and this is why there are so many people like killing themselves dude um you know i had a buddy like you know none of my buddies well none of my buddies that i was concurrent with i had friends that were previously gwat right but mm-hmm. like none of them went to war but a number of them killed themselves in the time since right and i think it's because you know and i was talking to them up to the point and then one day it just happened you know Mm-hmm. And um, it's just because they don't have anything to live for, mm-hmm. and um, and I think that's just being writ large. Sorry. Anyway, I, I got I got caught up, but just, no, you're good. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. Well, like I, I apologize, but I, I think it's important to say this. I'm not just trying to flex it. It's yeah. just. Um, that's the, the the challenge that is being beset against all of us, mm-hmm. not simply people that are of veteran status. It's also everyone else. They are born into this life, which means nothing. Yeah. It means nothing even to those who would try and seek the meaning within it. Which is why, of course, I actually one of the, the biggest white pills is, of course, that liberalism as such, bureau, bureau, like yeah, bourgeois lifestyle as such, mm-hmm. is being destroyed. And I believe that within the next 10 years... Whatever comes next, it mm-hmm. might not be good, but it'll be something different. Yeah. It'll be something that overcomes what we have experienced thus far. Right. And uh, that might be a negative or a positive, depending on who you are. But I think I'm not a Russia shill. I'm not a URC shill. But mm-hmm. I think there's something incredibly vital about providing a, a view of life that's at least different. Mm-hmm. It may not be better, but at least it's different. And it's an attempt at something greater, you know? Sure, yeah. Um, and, you know, kind of, again, like I wrote down some stuff based on what you said. And you talk about, like, the universal parts thing, right? And I think the best place you see this is in academia. Because, like, higher education, it seems today, is really no different than trade school or, like, a trade in the past. Because what education was for the Greeks, right? Like, you know, liberal arts gets thrown around. Well, liberal arts was the education of the aristocracy. You learn a little bit of everything, math, sciences, rhetoric, whatever, right? Because they weren't using their academics uh, to go work some job. That was part of their life. They were part of a specific class that had a specific role. And like, so like liberal arts today, someone who takes liberal arts, right? Um, you know, you're not going to get a fucking job with it because liberal arts is not meant to get a job with. All the majors that actually make you money are essentially trades, right? In higher education today, like being a computer programmer, engineering, yeah, chemical a, engineering, whatever it may be, yeah, right. It's all a trade. 100%. So why is higher education been diluted so much? Well, it's because they're trying to make it accessible to the masses, right? Um, which sounds great on paper, but even practically, or especially, well, even um, sorry, even in principle. Um, it doesn't really make any sense. Or wait, fuck. I, mean, I mix it up. I don't know. But practically, it doesn't make any sense because once you once you open up the floodgates, it's like you you talk to your average uh, college graduate today, and you think of what does it mean to be a college graduate, and you're like, this person fucking went through college. You know, like um, I have a friend. He does some 
no no offense to him he does cringe youtube stuff he goes and he does those <laughs> like he does those interviews with the you know dumb hot girls and like uh they're drunk and he like interviews them and shit and like i think it's pretty cringe but anyway he does this thing where he'll ask them like name name three countries that start with letter a and the amount of people that can't fucking name three countries that start with letter a and these are all college graduates like he'll ask them ahead of the time where do you go to college i'm like this is the fucking state of education today it's so diluted and i think it's primarily because instead of so like people had roles in the past don't get don't get me wrong right you had artisans whatever but i think i mean it's a twofold issue there's a lot of parts to it but essentially but this egalitarian ideal i think sort of streamlines a lot of the aspects of social hierarchy that held more meaning in the past and i don't quite know what i mean by this i need to think about it but what i mean is like if you go to japan today and you know japan has been castrated significantly um through our nation building right whatever but one thing that they still have in japan that they lack in quote unquote most, nation building right quote unquote right but one of the things they still have is uh Tr there's a spiritualization to having a trade in a sense and i mean spiritualization because people take their jobs fucking seriously um regardless of what it is and they still have that in japan today it's partially you know it's almost a, a negative aspect that they care about their job so much but it's this dedication to your craft no matter what it is like a fucking there's this guy who makes ramen every morning um, and it's literally vending machine ramen, but he put so much fucking work into creating the best ingredients, creating the best fucking vending machine ramen. And this is his life. He dedicates himself to this. There's like almost a spiritualization to something very material, which is just a job. But I feel like, and I, like I said, this is kind of just a thing I just thought about. And I don't know quite know what I mean by it, but it seems that like post-industrial society, turning people into cogs in a machine, kind of like what you said, um, you don't have artisans anymore, right? You have specific people who are specialized in a specific thing, and they do this thing, but there's no spiritualization anymore. Like in the past, right? Like you ever, you ever, you, you've, have you watched the Peaky Blinders? Yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. Do you remember that scene where Luca Changretta is talking about his suit and how his uncle uh, makes a suit in a basement and like every stitch is stitched with blood, you know? Yeah. It's like this yeah. I, it's idea that people people dedicate themselves to even a very simple craft, like a cobbler or whatever. Like there's something beautiful in, it's, it's kind of what we talked about with the peasants. Like peasants have a role. Peasants have a role in society and they fulfill that role beautifully. And that should be honored even if we ourselves understand that we are not the peasant, right? And you can respect that. But there's, there's no such thing resembling that today. Every job for most people is essentially a job. And this is why we respect guys like Musk, right? He's not like Bezos. He's not like Zuck, even though Zuck's becoming a little cooler with some of the stuff he's been yeah. doing recently. But Ch Musk, Ch Ch Zuck, I like it. All right. All yeah. Right. <laughs> I wonder if he, if when he taps out, dudes, he's like, "You just got sucked." <laughs> <laughs> you know. Yeah. No, I, I uh, anyway, once he beats ahead. up Musk, that's what he's going to do. But um, uh, but like Mu th that's the reason why we gravitate towards someone like Musk. It's not just a job for him. It's not just about making money. And I think that's something lost in post-industrial society. Is like everyone's being specialized. For a specific thing, and this is another reason I, I like was kind of disillusioned with the military. Is like when I joined the military originally, or when I went to a recruiter's office first, I was like, I want to be infantry, right? I want to fucking do the shit that people do. Mm -hmm. And then they're like, mm -hmm. you know, they bring my mom in. They have this big, you know, they have, yeah, that little talk with me, and they're like, actually, look at this thing. You can make a lot of money doing this job after you get out, and uh, you qualify for it because you have a high ASVAB. You should do this. I'm like, oh boy, that's super cool. But like. The, one of the reasons why there's no warriors anymore is because, like, what's a support MOS in terms of being a warrior? You're a fucking, you know, just, you don't get that feeling of being a warrior. Um, and I think this is all of society in general is, like, even, even, like, even in Greek times, like, I don't know. I don't, I don't want to expand on this too much because it's kind of like a undeveloped idea. But I just feel like there's a lack of spiritualization in what people do for a living. And Japan still has it somehow um, where what you do is something you dedicate yourself. And like, I can't help. Like you ever, um, I keep asking. Because the metaphysics, it's the metaphysics of their people is about excellence. And it's not about happiness. That's, that's the thing mm -hmm. that you, you notice. Um, um, basically, as you can tell, that it doesn't matter what exploit in life they choose. They their expectation writ large is that you're the best at that thing, mm -hmm. and therefore dedication to that comes as a consequence. 
which is something I'm trying to import into the United States. Yeah. Like, uh, there's something really, really fucking wrong with the American society that doesn't believe in discipline. Have mm -hmm. you noticed that? Follow yeah. your passion because it'll become easy. No, no, no. Even following your passion is fucking difficult. Do you think oh, yeah. I like like posting a million posts to the internet <laughs> like no like i don't like talking to a lot of people that are here I, I mean you're one of the few pleasures of types of people that i have the pleasure of speaking to mm -hmm. however the vast majority of people are are, are terrible yeah. like ev everything in life is pain um but i get what you're saying and if you don't mind me extrapolating no, a couple things it. from your ideas and First of all, I think it's important that people understand that as you live, you masticate ideas, your soul expels ideas and, you know, masticates them further as you go, which is why you should only trust ideas that come from epics of your time, of your life, when you feel the most strength. Mm -hmm. um, I, I have, uh, so for instance, Junger. He has a whole bunch of books. He has a shit ton of books. At the end of his, he was like a lifelong Nietzschean until the end of his life when he was old and decrepit. Yeah, became he became Catholic. A Catholic. Yeah. <laughs> that should teach you a lot. A, a man that writes Imasul and a man who writes Storm of Steel mm -hmm. is two completely, are two completely different individuals. Yeah. And that should apply to your own life. You should trust the thoughts mm -hmm. and aspirations you had when you were a child and when you were at the 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 crescendo of your of your adolescence slash young adulthood. Mm -hmm. um, I trust only thoughts that come to me when I'm coming from a position of strength. Yes. I don't trust the thoughts that I feel when I'm depressed. I don't trust the thoughts that I feel when I'm like downtrodden or on the 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 bottom side of the the boot. Mm -hmm. I trust the thoughts I had when I was eight years old playing Rome Total War for the first oh, time damn. and imagining in my mind the that best. I was Caesar. Uh -huh. I always remind myself when I'm feeling weak yeah. precisely of who I really am. Not when I'm weak, when I who I really am and that real person no matter – and and for those of you who are listening – there will be many people who will let you out, who want you to self-sabotage and say to you, it's okay, Anon. It's okay that you failed. <laughs> You're just human. No, no, no. My friend, if you are here on this, this chat right now, if you're here on this podcast right now, you're the kind of person that does not belong am amidst the mediocrity of society. You're precisely the person cut from a different fabric of life who has... Who fate set aside golden threads for you it is up to you to realize that potentiality anyone both yourself the bitch in the back of your head or the bitch outside telling you sweet nothings outside to self-sabotage and become nothing both these people are telling you lies the truth is painful always and the painful truth is that you were meant for more the reason why you're not achieving it is either because you're weak or because society is weak too. These are both valid reasons and that you must fight to mm -hmm. whatever end, to what, however soon it may become or however painful it may be, whatever ends it may, may take you, whether it's prison or hospital or, or <laughs> you know, whatever, death. Prison hospital. Follow it to whatever end. Make your soul into a bullet. And whatever happens on the other side of that pain that you penetrate... That's up to the gods, mm -hmm. not up to you. Your choice, your decision is to affirm that life with intensity all the way through. Everything else is a lie. Don't fall for lies. Don't fall for sweet nothings. Fight to whatever end. That's what I say. Based. I, yes. I definitely got some stuff to, to tap onto that. Um, it's like you, know, you mentioned the, the whole thing about like, um, you know, while we're in the military, we didn't quite get that experience that we joined for necessarily. And I think the closest I got was my Coast Guard deployment. It wasn't, it didn't reflect anything of the military sort of exploits that, that you kind of dream about as a, as a kid or whatever. However, I will say that even though it didn't quite capture anything from a military perspective exactly, I mean, it did a little bit. Like I was watching uh, Chinese Coast Guard boats fucking like, you know, two miles away following us. That was kind of cool. And like we got to work with like uh, the uh, the Thai Royal Navy, um, some other countries as well. Um, so it was cool. 
but like it wasn't combat obviously and i never really felt i was in danger or anything but i will say that being on a boat and it was a small boat too so this is it's a lot different than being on a navy ship like it's a it's literally 140 people on board it's small so it's like it's it was fucking nice and like i just remember i would go to the fantail the back of the boat and i would just read i'd read my fucking evola my my Junger, my mishima whatever the fuck dune <laughs> i finished three dune books the first three dune books on that patrol and yes. i would it was it was it was fucking the best thing in the world and like i had uh buddies there that had uh i i, I never really smoked a pipe before but it's like a I guess it's kind of a tradition and they'd bring their pipes out and I'd smoke with them and I'd read and we just fucking watch the sunset and it was, and sometimes I'd go box, um, boxing on a boat is hard cause it's fucking, especially cause it's a smaller boat. So it'd <laughs> rock, but like I genuinely found that was the happiest I was in my life. Like the happiest three months, like there's single days that were better than those, than days in those three months. But in terms of like a, a period of your mm-hmm. life, right? Yeah. That was the happiest cause there was no distractions. I couldn't go on the internet. I couldn't fucking, you know, get, I mean, getting, getting plastered and port calls was fun. Don't get me wrong, but I couldn't just drink whenever I wanted to. Um, I didn't have access to great food whenever I wanted to. It was shit food. It wasn't bad because it's the Coast Guard, but it wasn't great. Um, like, it was just so pure because it's like, I think ultimately the reason why we, a lot of depression exists in modern life is because you don't live in accordance with nature. Nature does not give you abundance. So when you live under the conditions of scarcity to a certain extent, I think you are happier and all I did was work out, read, shoot the shit with people, watch the sun, look at the waves, and I was so fucking happy, dude. Um, so I, so like, even though I didn't get the military sort of like, oh, you know, storm of steel, I did get something worth, like, valuable in terms of just life in general, and that was pretty beautiful. But um, one thing I wanted to say, I think you were talking about, fuck, uh, I'm trying to remember the specific point because I wasn't going to go so long on the Coast Guard thing, but you, you said something, I think it had to do with... Um, Fuck, you just, there's, was the very... No, I, you know, to, sorry, not to interrupt, yeah. but I want to add on, like, mm-hmm. I agree with you, and this is why I want to, I want to tr- transform America into a barrack society, because I think that actually what has undone us as mm-hmm. a nation is precisely how much, how plenty, how plentiful everything is, and I'm not talking about it from a prude sense, like, I've done hard drugs, I've done, you know, I've banged a lot of holes, I've done <laughs> X, Y, and Z, like you know i'm not a prude out of the set like i'm not a prude first of all Mm -hmm. but second of all i'm not like attacking these things from a position that i couldn't do these things i did these things and they turned to ash in your mouth Mm -hmm. whatever has given me happiness in my life is precisely those times that it is is exactly what you said is is is, uh simple living Mm -hmm. simple uh discipline um, or of course at the ends of exhaustion. Um, so both, but like all of it has been a type of pain for most. And uh, I agree with you, brother. Like it, it's really frustrating to me that people want to live this like rapper lifestyle and they don't realize that these people are miserable. Like they're miserable in an existential sense, in a spiritual sense. And yeah, they can like gratify their dopamine receptors until they fry their brain. Mm-hmm. Um, however, the happiness, the happiest you'll ever be is precisely at the places that you're trying to avoid. Um, and that sounds like a, a fucking a riddle, but it really isn't. It's the, uh, you know, it's, you know who you are. If you're listening to this, you're probably in the military or you like military shit. Um, or you're an artisan. Usually I have like, like basically blue collar guys and stuff Mm -hmm. and there's nothing wrong with that either. Um, but what I'm saying is it's precisely at discipline. It's at your trade. It's doing things that's like humble, um, that will make you happy. Um, people that fall to avarice and all that kind of stuff, those people, they're miserable, dude. Like I can see through their shit Mm -hmm. and they're just selling you snake oil when they tell you that you need a Bugatti, (laughs) you know what I mean? Yeah. And, uh, like, as much as I don't, I don't shit on, like, Andrew Tate too much. Mm-hmm. Like, I just think that, like, his idea of what is good in life is just money and women. Yeah, and I, I really don't think that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't, I don't really think that. I think it's spiritual. But, like, yeah. I do appreciate his, like, masculinity kind of posting. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? He's like, funny. And I, <laughs> he's one of the few people. Yeah, he's funny. He's one of the few people who says so unrepentantly and without, um, without being cringe too. Yeah. So that's another thing. So 
Anyway, go ahead. Uh, hopefully you caught up now. Yeah, no, I still can't quite remember what I was going to bring up. But just like the Andrew Tate thing, like, it's funny because uh, I remember like I started off my quote unquote philosophical journey as like kind of like, you know, I wasn't like a crazy Christian, but I was I was at least thought I was a Christian, you know. Um, I was like uh-huh. still on that vibe, still on like the stoic. Because I think a lot of times the stepping stones, even for people in our niche, um, is still like the very broad you start off, like for me at least, it could be different for you, but I start off very broad. Like, um, you know, I, I had the inkling towards, you know, let's say more dissident opinions. However, in terms of like actual material, I started off, you know, I'd, I'd watch Jordan Peterson in a uh, podcast before he was a grifting bitch. Of um, I would uh, <laughs> read Seneca and Marcus Aurelius. And I, you know, I was, I, I kind of was like, Oh, by the way, yeah. 12 steps to to life 12 yeah. rules to life are one of those rules to bang his his daughter do i get one of those the the 12 <laughs> rules to life or is no, that only andrew tate gets read? that ah gotcha yeah, okay because he, cool. cause he right. banged his yeah. daughter but um <laughs> hey michaela <laughs> peterson's bad i'll say that yeah <laughs> I know. she is pretty she's she is pretty bad but uh, i i just think it's funny like the greatest uh refutations of his philosophy is like you could see his his house his house is mm-hmm. actually a mess his mm. his daughter is actually the best example against him. Like, mm. bro, like, come on now. Like, anyway, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. sorry. Yeah, Everyone could, interrupts. We could definitely I had to him. enter Peter Steen. <laughs> right. I had to enter Peter Steen signal. <laughs> for sure, for sure. But, um, fuck. So, yeah, um, yeah, I started off with a very broad scale stuff. So, like, still stuck in that, like, oh, you know, moral virtue and shit like that. So, I guess I just, I just mentioned that because if anyone, like, has... So some people have been along um, for like, I guess, my quote unquote philosophical journey or whatever. But you'll really see the change in my opinions when I started reading Nietzsche. Um, and like, just because I, I just thought of it because you brought up Andrew Tate. And like, I have like this one video where it's like I was critiquing Andrew Tate. And like, there were valid critiques. But I took it a little far in the sense that I was like, you know, Andrew Tate has multiple women. And I believe in monogamy and all this shit, you know, like the like as a Christian. So I think it was funny <laughs> seeing like my my own. Uh, what do you call it? Not transformation, but like, you know, just movement in a certain direction. Like, and, you know, I'm not shitting on monogamy either, uh, but I'm not. I'm not hating on him for fucking a bunch of broads either. Like, you know, as long as as long as you get what you need to get done, go ahead, Andrew. You know, I'll, for now, I'll criticize the other aspects that are that are more uh, pressing. You know, like uh, yeah, my <laughs> my biggest take. Um, you know, Teddy Roosevelt wrote this. He's you know the man, man of the arena. I'm sure you've heard. Of oh, before, I love that right? poem. Yeah. And so many of us are just critics, Mm -hmm. and so few of us are men who could even compete in the same arena as Andrew Tate. Mm -hmm. It's ludicrous to believe that, like, I mean, I might disagree with him, just Mm -hmm. as I might disagree with BAP or anyone else, but, uh, or even, you know, fuck it, Jordan Peterson. This guy's far more intelligent, far richer, far better than me. Like, at the end of the day, if someone turned the mirror upon myself, who Mm -hmm. would I be compared to him? At least right now. You hit precisely but what i'm trying to say is that um i'm writing this for yourself as a mm-hmm. as a note for yourself because we are a constant becoming and that's what nietzsche says he doesn't yeah. want people to take him as an end but a beginning mm-hmm. um and you must be true to yourself but also that you'll change like yeah. we are like flames right like just like heraclitus believed like souls are like flames mm-hmm. and they're dynamic over time i think the only thing you should hold true to is precisely those times that you feel strong yes. or strongest um not when you're feeling weak so when you're a 80 year old man god forbid you <laughs> you end up at that level uh if you get to be 80 years old remember remind yourself that you weren't you're not 80 years old you're not your body you are who you were when you were 21 mm-hmm. you know what i mean yeah for me i think my height of my powers was 23 i think i was really fucking like in the groove i was like yeah i always think to myself when i'm being weak what i would think of myself when i was 23 and i was like no 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 my friend i am I, i'm living in illusion this pain <laughs> this sadness whatever it's an illusion mm mm-hmm. mhm that's when I was real. That's yeah. who I should be. And that's the, the standard I should hold myself to. Shit, I turned 23 like in two months when I'm in the Philippines, actually. Oh, so, congratulations. Yeah, maybe, congratulations. I'll, uh, maybe I'll hit that doxed. threshold. Doxed. I'm already doxed. <laughs> Every, everyone, I, see, that's the thing. No one can dox me because like, I have everything. Like, It's very easy yeah. to find out who I am. But like, at this point, 
I'm not staying. I'm just joking. I know, I know, joking, yeah. I know. But um, like I, you know, like me personally, low key being like, oh, I'll, I'll, I've said it before. Being half minority, low key has been why I've never gotten in trouble for the shit I said. <laughs> like it, I'm the sec- I am the secret weapon of the right because I just say whatever the fuck Based. I want and I can kind of get away with it. Kind of like I I experience Based. more pinko bullshit from white liberals than anything else. Like it's always I'm like you can't say that. That's white supremacy. I'm like what? Yeah, it, precisely. Like as much as Nietzsche would disagree with me, mm-hmm. here's where I disagree with Nietzsche, and this yeah. is why I'm right. Uh, no, no, no. But like, I believe that like uh, a man's soul, yeah, it may be like uh, the product of his body, but his convictions, his ideology is fundamentally mm-hmm. a, a product of his biology, right? So, yeah. though we may be reaching across ethnicities and races, etc., I think that you and I are more akin than. Mm-hmm. I think even like you know who like Nick X, y, or, Z or somebody, people. dude. Yeah, like I, I'm not like like chomping at the bit to see Mandic or something like that. Mm-hmm. Like uh, I I I respect you. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I don't respect these other dudes. Um, and and yeah, that's something I think people don't get. And uh, I, I get I get why people are pushing against it because there is this big ethnic cleansing happening mm-hmm. against like obviously white people or yeah. whatever. But like at the same time, there's like this there's this delineation. It's like you gotta be wignat, but you also can't be like retarded. Mm-hmm. Like it's like a happy medium, you know, Aristotelian yes. golden mean, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's really funny. Is like Wignats hate me because of this opinion, and then yeah. Libtards hate me because of any opinion. But, you know, <laughs> it is what it is. I can... but like I said, the, the biggest mission I have is against communism writ wide, and that's you know liberalism is just communism in my my opinion. Um, it's a just final diluted, form. you know, precisely. It started with uh, well, not to get all Nietzschean, but like it's <laughs> it's it started. Uh, I would say well. All right, look, I'll, I'll preface this. I, I, I still will take stuff from the Bible. I take stuff from the Bible. I have a Bible verse on my back. I mean, granted, I got that when I was more Christian. But, like, I'm not shitting on Christianity as a whole. But let's, you know, we have to look at Christianity and, and perhaps, like, just Abrahamic face in general as proto-Marxism in a lot of ways. So that doesn't mean, like, I have plenty of friends that are Christian, and sometimes I think that they're Christian for the wrong reasons. Like it's like Nietzsche talks about the Antichrist. Like uh, a lot of the positive aspects of Christianity are like good instincts that are masked behind Christianity, right? So like, you know, that's why I think a lot of like the Groypers are hypocrites, right, and so on and so right. forth, or Christian nationalists, Mike Ma types. Um, but you know, I still find a lot of uh, what do you call it? Um, value for example in in biblical teachings but i've realized that ultimately taking that as a guiding doctrine is insufficient same like the way i read evola is kind of like how i might read the bible for example right like there's these there's these dogmas right but you can't take them as dogmas you can take some lesson from them and all that to say the abrahamic faiths i feel like are low-key Low key, the origins of 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 Marxist thought. Um, no, so- no, no, high key, high key, <laughs> high key. Like hundred percent. Like I, I say this, and many people dislike me, but uh-huh. but this also here's the thing. You know, it doesn't mean just because something is the origin of something doesn't mm-hmm. mean that there aren't good things of it. Like, yeah. For instance, the Soviet Union. Um, people don't know this, but like Mussolini was super inspired by like the soviet union even when it was coming to power Mm -hmm. he was a socialist first yeah precisely Mm -hmm. and um but just because you like aspects of something doesn't Mm -hmm. mean you're that thing right and uh i I guess what i'm trying to say is that there are many important spiritual lessons that christianity taught us Mm -hmm. as like a civilization that previous pagan christianity could not Mm mm-hmm and obviously, as a Nietzschean, this is probably a great portrayal. But, um, uh, but like, I think the most poignant part is uh, the idea of a soul-body dichotomy. As much as that might be the biggest thrust Nietzsche has against Socrates and Plato, mm-hmm. um, I think there is something to be said about the primacy of will as a soul as opposed to will as a body. Hmm. Um, but here's the difference, though, is that Nietzsche says that there is a, a, you know, Socrates created that skewer to be able to say those that are ugly are not necessarily their souls. They're just 
you know, happenstance. No, no, no. I say that your body is a receipt. You know, it's the receipt hmm. of who your soul is. Interesting. Um, and I think that civilization writ large is precisely that. I believe in the will. I believe in agency. Um, Nietzsche doesn't, for mm -hmm. those of you who are listening. Um, and obviously, Nietzsche even says in the genealogy of morals, he says that he who is only a, a pupil of mine uh, repays me very little. You know, he ba he basically says that like he should only ever be a beginning. Mm -hmm. And I suppose, like especially if you read military accounts, which I do constantly, I'm a consummate reader of military history, science, and so on. The primacy of the agent of uh, of, of leadership, of willpower, of uh, X, Y, or Z is the difference between life and death, of uh, success and defeat and so on. And uh, I, I think life is just war. Mm -hmm. And it might be in different circumstances with different rules and different games. But there is something to be said. There is something, there is a soul. And uh, I think the Christians are right about that. And I'll concede to them hmm. on that point, frankly. Hmm. Um, and I think it's not just Christian. I think there are many different cultures, even the the Aryan like cultures, like sure. specifically like before Christianity, believes that too. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, you know, obviously, the the Han and and everyone does. Even people that are not connected with each other, the Polynesians, for instance. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Yeah. So at the end of the day, like I guess what my wider point that I'm trying to make is that you should never purity spiral. And this is mm -hmm. something that Oswald Spangler talks about a himself, a famous uh, Michelin. Um, <laughs> he, the, the beauty of him is that he said a, a, a person's aristocracy uh, or aristocratic bearing is rendered by the intensity of his resemblance to an ideal, not the purity mm. Of his ideal which is different right these things these concepts are akin however one is not necessarily the other and he explicates the difference as like for instance flame right mm -hmm. look at the sun the sun is full of helium and it's full of uh, i believe it's hydrogen or something and basically these reactions right it's flame right mm -hmm. however of course in the sun, there are a bunch of impurities. There are a bunch of uh, chemical reactions that are happening that are not given to combustion. Um, does that make the sun any less brilliant? Mm -hmm. Not really. No, it's a, it's still intensely the sun. Every morning I wake up, that motherfucker's there. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, um, that's what I think people should allude to, which is why I think purity spiraling actually is the product of someone who is a sclerotic soul. Um, the difference is the b difference between us and the left, the mm -hmm. quote unquote cosmopolitan left is that when I believe in crossing ethnicities or people or whatever, mm -hmm. I believe them towards different ends. I mm -hmm. believe them towards strength. Yes. They believe in doing stuff towards weakness. Right. They believe exactly. in doing things down. Mm. The, it's not about left or right. It's about up or down. It's yes. about life or death. And I believe that they're the faction of death, mm -hmm. and they per, they claim themselves to be life. And I yes. believe we're the faction of life. And mm -hmm. that's why we were able to give the battle cry, "Long live death." <laughs> and it, it's the dichotomy of the soul that makes it different. And I know that sounds like kind of like a mind fuck. And for those of you who are like confused right now, don't worry. I'll explain later and be equally <laughs> as mysterious. Okay. Based. But anyway, go ahead. Yeah. So again, I have a shit ton of stuff from that. And then I remembered what I was going to say earlier that I forgot to say. So that's good. Um, so yeah. before, before I build up, I'm going to start off by, you know, sort of providing my thoughts on the soul. So, when I was in my Coast Guard deployment, I wrote I wrote a little book, and I kind of didn't really mean for anything to happen with it, so barely anyone's read it. Uh, I'll I'll refer you to it afterwards because you might get a kick out of it. And although some of my ideas have changed, it's give it's, me now. What's up? <laughs> you will give Gib. Yeah, you know, I got you. I got you. Um, I'll send right, you after right. the. Go ahead. After Sorry, I didn't interrupt. <laughs> no, you're good. You're good. Um, but seriously, do give it to me after. Yeah, yeah I will. Um, a lot of my ideas have changed, but it has a rough outline of my beliefs, which I think is good. I wrote it mainly because I'm, you know, who knows? I might die randomly. I could have died in my car crash, and that's all that would have gone on. Not very Misham of me, because he said action. You know, it's like the writer writes for a false sense of eternity. So sorry, Mishima, but you also wrote too. <laughs> but anyway, um, so in it, I write 
um, I'm going to write a book one day called, assuming I don't die first, called Radical Aesthetics. And the whole point of Radical Aesthetics is going to be my view of metaphysics. So you talk about the soul. And I sort of agree, but I sort of disagree. And here's why I disagree. I don't think that everybody has a soul that's human. And what I mean by that is... Oh, based. Yeah, yeah. I believe this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the reason why is because I think a soul is a culmination of different things. Most importantly being, first of all, self-awareness is very important, right? Um, another thing that's part of, you know, this... So basically... Um, let me just make it simply kind of provide my thought. So it's radical aesthetics. And the meaning behind that is essentially that, um, and most people would disagree with this. This is kind of a niche opinion I have. So you take, you take a, a, an artist, for example, right? Um, and you have, an, you have a canvas in front of him and you have a bunch of colors, you know, red, yellow, blue, whatever the fuck. On its own, the canvas is just a canvas and the, you know, the, the colors are just colors. They, they hold no real significance, right? Now, the artist, as what I call an architect of metaphysics, takes all these colors and, and he, he mixes them, he makes them look nice, and then he paints them across the canvas and he creates something utterly beautiful. And this thing that has become beautiful from all these meaningless parts is, is like the creation of the soul to me. It's something that begins without significant, like someone who's just born, he's just material, you're just meat and bones, whatever. There's nothing special about them. However, the difference between like what the the example I just gave is that as a human, you're both the artist and the art. And it is a very Mishima type thing, right? And radical aesthetics is turning these individual colors, which on their own aren't worth that much, into something that is greater than the sum of its parts. You create this beautiful painting that evokes this this sort of spiritual feeling of like, wow, humans are capable of such beauty. So I think it's like, I don't know if imminence is the right word. I don't think imminent is the right word, but like, I don't know, fuck semantics, but essentially I believe that the soul is something that is attained through things that be, begin as simply material and that some people are both either born with great talent towards this or born with great will and that ultimately they can will themselves to transcend the material into something metaphysical. And this is, I have to do, I, this is why I kind of want to study like physics more so I can like into the meat and potatoes and the analytics behind it. But one of my great, one of the, my, um, Great life works is going to be trying to prove this, that the metaphysical is created through a manipulation of a manipulation by the will of materials towards something greater. And this kind of goes into my Based. my my final view of things, um, which is like um, here's where I so here's one way I can interpret uh, the second coming of Christ and Christianity from like a, you know, like a interpreting it kind of way is that in a sense, once we and this is why. For, to my little degree of knowing of futurism, I think it's cool. I think ultimately the final battle of life is to be in charge before singularity. Because once we reach singularity, it sort of solidifies um, all these material things that exist. So like if you believe in singularity and exponential growth, like we will eventually reach a point where um, we're just, you know, infinitely expanding and infinitely progressing, you know, that, that sort of point. If you believe in that, then the great battle of life, Ragnarok, the rapture, it's not something where good is guaranteed a victory. Evil can win. Our job, me and you, maybe not in this generation, but maybe generations from now, is to ensure that we, the forces of light, are in power before that moment of singularity. Because whoever the fuck is in power yes. before that solidifies everything. So that's those that two-prong explanation is my view of radical aesthetics. And if you want to give your thoughts... Uh, feel free. I have a couple of things I want to bring up based on things you said earlier, but yeah. You know, it's interesting that you say that because I think a lot of our instincts are really synchronized. I believe the same thing too. Maybe not in so many words because mm -hmm. my brain is not like necessarily, obviously no one's brain works exactly yeah. the same. However, uh, I think you're, you're pawing at exactly the same concept and I feel exactly the same way. I think that evil can win. I think that there are higher... Um, the, the world that we live in is the real world. There's no like quote unquote meta. There's no mm -hmm. world apart. Actually, this world is just infinitely deep. Yes. If that makes sense. Yes. And, absolutely. uh, and that, you know, we live in this world when we die, we don't leave it. We just get incorporated in a different current. Yes. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Well, what that means is basically everything you do in this life matters. Mm -hmm. Life is a religious event and it's graded, buddy. Yes. There's no time ever that anyone is looking away. Mm -hmm. Imagine that even when you're working out, your innermost thoughts inside of your head, all the time, all throughout your life, 
are it, it, it's basically there's an audience mm-hmm. people can know they know what you're thinking what you're doing what you're saying what you're you're doing and ultimately ultimately like i i believe in i believe what your your project is and i i think uh bat pushes against this and allegedly obviously like we should do our part he's mm-hmm. never outwardly assumed his uh, alleged persona but yeah. this individual who is alleged <laughs> to be bap yes Kostin Alamaru, uh this guy went to mit bachelor's degree for math mm-hmm. specifically i don't know if you guys know this but mit is the preeminent college for math <laughs> specifically yeah and as an under as a bachelor that is the most difficult thing to do because you have to have been a prodigy i mean mm-hmm. this guy is clearly a very intelligent person um however i would say that he says that he he discards the idea of higher order geometries which which what, what he's talking about is this idea um that we live beyond four dimensions right because there's like three dimensions and then there's time which is the fourth right mm-hmm. um so so tetra you know tetrarchs or whatever the fuck it's called i'm not a math head i hate math i like people <laughs> people's my thing but the most interesting thing that's come out recently is how the will or thoughts specifically i'll i'll link you the the uh the psychological the psychogenetic fucking shit that mm-hmm. happened recently but it said that people can epigenetically alter themselves on thoughts alone and of course this is relating to stress and how stress affects um your genetics but the most specific thing that it was talking about it's not just how stress affects your epigenetic um you know circumstances it's it's actually that stress causes specific epigenetic abnormalities specific ones which is different right it's not like you're just doing carpet bombing of your 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 genetics you know strands uh stress actually affects specifically almost to the point where it's almost intelligent you know so your will is intelligent Mm -hmm. Uh, what we call the will or the soul is of course this kind of religious or spiritualized or artistic way of explicating what we mean by agency and um, that's something that's within our control and I think it's something that like most people they especially on the left but mm-hmm. especially like with bap they they try to um to cut away they try to think that there's no such thing as agency there's only biology mm-hmm. and i disagree with that i think that there is agency but also there's a, obviously biology so yes. it gives you a, a left and right lateral limit mm-hmm. however you're supposed to be operating within it and that's that's your will you mm-hmm. know like whether or not you are able to achieve the goal within it that's you in your next life, you'll be gifted a body that has wider cone of capes and limbs. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. So that's that's my that's my personal conviction. Um, so I'm really glad that we, you and I, both resonate on mm-hmm. this um, this subject because that's how I believe too. You yeah. know, and we definitely uh, obviously these. I think when it comes to stuff like this, it's like super complicated. So we should definitely uh, talk more about that offline at some point too. Cause like we, if we had, if we, if we had a conversation like this for like a podcast and we, cause we could go a long time about just that. Just imagine how many like complicated, crazy shit we get into. So like we definitely <laughs> should talk more about that, but to go back to the, to the, you know, the, the more meat and potatoes stuff. Um, uh-huh. I just wanted to, two, two topics I wanted to bring up, you know, you talked about like, um, you know, at 80, think how you did when you were 20 or like, you know, Junger at the end of his life sort of, you know, he, he, he caves in almost. Right. Um, and I think this is part of, and you, you know, everyone always says, read Mishima and you'll understand why he did what he did. And they're completely right because whether it's, um, you know, I think the sea of fertility really captures ultimately the culmination of what Mishima ends up doing. You know, like you said, you know, he, he kills himself while he is still relatively strong. I think he was about 40. So he wasn't super young, but he was still in good health. He still had that youthful exuberance, um, which he really, it's, it's funny because he's almost like a Benjamin Button in a sense. Like he kind of, he kind of is born an old soul, you know, and frail. Yeah. And it's like a reverse aging process. Mishima's, I wonder, I'm going to like start like, I never been on 4chan before, but I'm going to start a 4chan conspiracy about how Benjamin Button's based on Mishima. But, um, 
He's literally like a Benjamin Button type character. He starts off old in the mind and in the, no, sorry. Yeah. Old in the mind and body. And then over time is like sort of becoming young again. And I think, you know, you've read, um, you've, have you've, have you read all the books in Sea of Fertility? I have actually, I, I have them right on, like they're stacked right next to all my Nietzsche Base. books. So yeah, I've yeah. read all of you, Kumishima. Well, no, no, no. All his stuff that's been translated into English. Gotcha. Um, which is different. And by the way, there's a great account on Twitter for those of you listening of a guy who is a complete Spurg. Um, he's called Mazaki, but he's going other under different names for different reasons. He's <laughs> kind of a freak, but he's doing an uh, invaluable service by translating uh, for the first time from Japanese into English a number of different Yuko Mishima works. But please continue. Based. Um, shout out. But um, <laughs> um, <laughs> so you've read Temple of Dawn, and I think. You see Honda, he's this sort of virtuous person at first. Like we think of Honda as the voice of reason in Spring Snow. Yes. Um, he, he, he goes out of his way to be selfless in Runaway Horses. And then you really see the decay of his character in Temple of Dawn. You see him become this fucking pervert, this old, emaciated, sort of gross person. And you're like, this is not the Honda I once knew. And it's, it's really depressing. Like when I was reading Temple of Dawn, I was fucking depressed, you know, because he's becoming yes. a perv. He wants to Me fuck. Too. Yeah. Like you should be, right? And he wants to fuck the 17-year-old girl. Like, what happened to Honda who, you know, literally changed his career to save Esau? Um, And I almost wonder, because like people say that, you know, Mishima puts a little bit of his character into all his work. So I wonder if Mishima sees Honda as like, this is what happens when you age. This is what could happen to me if I age. So the only way to ensure, because like obviously Mishima did a lot of weird shit in his life too. Let's not turn away from that. But he always had this will towards purity. He wanted to be like Esau, which is why the final act of his life is so profound, right? And I think yeah. the profoundity, or whatever the fuck the word is, for that act profundity. is like profundity, yeah. right? Like yeah. he's he's choosing not to become Honda. He's choosing not to be defined by the vices in his life. He's choosing to end his life like Esau would end his life. He's choosing to end his life with the most yeah. youthful and like culminating expression of his art. And I think that's such a beautiful thing. Even like, you know, people can be like, oh, he's such a narcissist or whatever. Fuck that. Egotism is necessary. You know, like Nietzsche yes. said it himself. Yes. Um, yes. So fuck all that noise. Like, I think what he did is beautiful, um, even if it was brutal. You, you know, I'm really glad that you said that because the greatest authors mm -hmm. are actually those who are the greatest psychologists and yes. that's something that a lot of quote-unquote writers that write crap mm -hmm. they don't get it is that basically the difference between uh you know the greatest art ar artists of our time is whether or not they're able to tap into a psyche of mm -hmm. truth of the human truth Dostoevsky is of course one of the main influences on Nietzsche people don't know this but this is also why I respect Yuko Mishima so much mm -hmm. Um, and for the for those of you who are veterans, uh, I think the best way, or people that are just aware of how rifles work, but you know how you shoot a bullet, there's a little bit of a climb, but it's basically straight until finally it reaches the end of its effective range, and mm -hmm. then it starts drooping, yes. and it falls? Mm -hmm. That's exactly how I see a soul. That's mm -hmm. how I see a life. Mm -hmm. When you're birthed onto this world and your mother shit you out into this world, <laughs> you're basically, your soul is so like strong and powerful and it has a trajectory that is straight and narrow. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the, the strength of your soul is, dict is, is commensurate with how long you can keep your youth for, um, for as long as you can. Pure youth, pure mm -hmm. idealism, pure unrelenting discipline towards something, even through whatever it may be, whatever life. This is why I think the the boomers are actually um, the worst generation, aside from everything else, <laughs> is because the boomers, yes, of course, they ape the actions of youth. They try to do like they try to go like I went to a big college, a big football college. They always mm. come back, you know, the seven year old bodies trying to act like they're 21 yeah. again. <laughs> There's something so repulsive and disgust. I remember one time I was at a football game with my friends tailgating and then there's this truck that pulls up aside from us and there's just like these 70 year olds doing what we were doing and i felt mm -hmm. so repulsed it's like seeing <laughs> fat people eat i yeah. was so repulsed by how what they were doing by proxy that i i just went home i told them i had a stomach ache they called me a pussy and everything but i was like <laughs> dude no dude i just they wouldn't understand it because they're too yeah. much of a you know uh, you know they're just they don't understand spiritual nausea 
Yeah, I was just so disgusted mm -hmm. because I, I was thinking to myself, I, I was I was infected by proxy. This entire experience was infected, mm -hmm. and I was upset. I was pissed off, and uh, I don't think at the time I could articulate what I was feeling. But I'm glad that my my soul had the instinct to get away. Mm -hmm. um, but I agree with you, and I think that um, you need to be understanding of how strong your soul is. And most of us, I think I realized that my soul started drooping after like 25. My mm -hmm. bullet started dropping at 25. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really scary to me because, of course, we fight to be strong and intense. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, some things are metaphysically beyond our control. Yeah. We can choose whether or not we stay in it or not, uh, whether or not we can be intense. However, I mean, I I'm sad to say, unfortunately for myself even, um, that maybe even willing to be against that, even trying to be pure into old age, you still become a character at the end mm -hmm. who's disgusting and decrepit at the end, mm -hmm. decadent at the end. And um, that's the unfortunate thing. And I think that's why Mishima was talking about how beautiful heaven becomes when we die young, because mm -hmm. it's the world in its wake is left by young souls who shaped it ideally and not from decrepit you know to solitude and this is what's happening in the west mm -hmm. is that on on par for instance within the european population um the older generation is a bunch of olds they're like the majority of people are a bunch of olds they've mm -hmm. reproduced under the replacement rate and that is one of the most alarming things and that's precisely why things are falling apart you know what i mean mm -hmm. there's too many old people that are willing to sell themselves they, they, they're become like too uh insensitive to they, they've become basically Jaded. too uh cor corrupted no yeah. no corrupted, corrupted? Mm -hmm. a lifelong experience of corruption has caused them to be able to give up on themselves and so they think and they they infect the younger generation with that this is why I believe in fire, because the fire always revitalizes a, a forest. It's an old forest becomes new when it wipes away the old. Mm -hmm. I think we do a disservice when we live past 50. I think 50 is a really good upper limit. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe 60, let's say. 65, I think, is a good limit. Yeah. But after that, I think it's for the very, very few. Yes. The, the like, truly gifted, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? That should yes. live beyond that. But that's pretty much it. I agree. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to challenge you to not die young. Because of this reason. <laughs> Ultimately, we can... Dude, I've been suicidal since I was seven. So, I mean, like, you know, the fact that I'm here is a fucking work of art. You know what I mean? Yeah, well, you got to continue, and I'll tell you why. <laughs> it's all good and beautiful to die at 30 in a hail of gunfire. But let's be honest. The world is not ready for that. Because if that's the norm, if sacrifice and battle in that way is the norm, it's fine if we die. But if we're the few people who think this way... Who, who think in, like, we believe we're right, and we believe that we're what we're working towards is right. If we are not alive to institute that change, then it's a it's like kind of what I said with the Arabs in uh, T. Lawrence, right? Like, if we die now yes. for, like, some stupid, vain reason, like, oh, look at me, I'm going to die beautifully, I'm going to commit seppuku in Kyoto or whatever. Like, I mean, not not in Mishima's case, but, like, in our case, right? If we... We have not done well, enough. Well, Mishima, that's the difference is that we are no one. Yes, Mishima exactly. Was someone. He was sacrificing something. Yes. You know, like, that's the thing. If I killed myself for the gods, like, mm -hmm. the gods don't give a fuck. Who the fuck am I? That's like, what I mean. He, Mishima was someone, you know? Yeah, we'd be, like, no better Precisely. than... Precisely. We'd be no better than Bushno. Um, but um, <laughs> oh, I made a funny meme about that I got to send to you. Um, <laughs> but... Um, uh, no, I'll send that after. It's, it's a funny one. Anyway, um... <laughs> Uh, fuck. So the reason I say I, I can't have you fucking die. I can't fucking die. People like us can't fucking die because we have a fucking mission. We can die once we've secured the future. Until then, if we die yeah. now, it's fucking stupid. It's like, uh, you've seen letters from Iwo Jima, right? I have. Yeah. And you remember he says like, <clears throat> I can't speak Japanese really, but he's like, I will not allow any of you to die until you've killed 10 Americans or some shit like that. As some shit like that, right? That's why I'm saying to you, you cannot die until we fucking secured the future. Because ultimately, our death means nothing until it, until you know it means something, um, so to speak. You so know, like, I agree with you, and I'll, I'll give you some real shit here, mm -hmm. maybe to tie up the end here. Yeah. You know, I got trouble. I got in 
trouble and I got like basically was gonna get you know got kicked out whatever yeah um but every day of my life I think one of the most important impactful stories I I read when I was a kid was Alexander Dumas Count of Monte Cristo mm, yeah and the the entire story revolves around this for those of you who don't know um it basically um the protagonist the main character he has basically uh, you know a girlfriend and his friend his great rival Mondego who he thought was his friend and it was set at this time when Napoleon was on Elba which is right off the coast of uh Italy right after he was defeated at water uh, not waterloo at uh, the in initial 1813 whatever ceasefire mm -hmm. um and basically he got caught he got ratted on long story short basically his best friend out of jealousy uh betrayed him his confidence and so he became a political prisoner and was uh basically sent to prison in this place called uh the chateau d'if which is a real place, by the way, where they, the French royal regime sent its political dissidents. And he spent 10 years in like solitary confinement, um, alone, with no exposure to people except for on the anniversary of every time he arrived there, where he was flogged. Um, and basically, the only thing that kept him alive was two things, of course, uh, a priest that had tunneled his way with a spoon into his cell, and he, they became friends, and this <laughs> priest educated him in, in the ways, um, but also his unburning, unending feeling of revenge to destroy Mondego, who had originally outdone him in a sword fight and how, outdone him uh, mentally and outdone him uh, in a political sense and that ultimately the end of the story is him having taken back the girl his child from his girl who he turns out he had cucked his friend that Damn. was a total fucking traitor and, and how he killed Mondego <laughs> for me um, I felt that like uh, I wanted to do Yukio Mishima myself you know when I got in trouble mm -hmm. because I knew the writing was on the wall yeah. However, I I knew that like I was one of those very very few people, and if I might be so bold as to say, I'm one of those few gifted people, uh, with a facility for speech and understanding others, that I knew if I killed myself, there would be no future mm -hmm. or any great future, and that, just like Cato, the younger understood when the end of his duty came mm -hmm. i understood where the beginning of mine came you right. know um and so for me i understood in that moment that it's necessary for people such as you and i and and you who are listening to this recording right now how important it is to live on mm -hmm. to live on and fight not just live on in cowardice and in the shadows but to fight adequately to expose yourself even to humiliation so that way you may permanence and actually at the end of everything at the end of all of it conquer the communist foe <laughs> um and this is a a a spiritual mission that is pervasive not just throughout the west but the world and one of the few places that exists outside of it is probably thailand which is the only place i know specifically that is like still on the level a little bit spiritually but you know everywhere is fucked even in africa i mean i was in africa i was in like the congo for a little se a second there and like oh, everyone still thinks the same way we do and so it's up to our leadership and our agency and our will to power to change the world and make it beautiful um and unfortunately uh suicide is a privilege that is not given to you i refuse mm -hmm. i refuse you the allowance to do so you must fight you must fight even if it must be ignominiously mm -hmm. you must fight so that way other people can live nobly and uh if that is a, a great burden on your your back then you must do so and uh i feel that same way personally i feel like every day of my life that i draw breath i wake up i wake up with tears in my eyes honestly out of frustration However, I know that like I have one mission, one mission only, is to defeat communism, mm -hmm. like spiritual communism. Yeah. 
and I'll do that in this life or the next. Yeah, it doesn't matter how many times they kill me. I'll come back. I'll come back again and again and again. Again and again until they're all beautiful. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yes. Maybe we already I are. Hope that's the, not uh, metaphysical. No, schizo. I like <laughs> I like schizo metaphysics. I I'm gonna create um, my own religious doctrine where I'm gonna trace um, I'm gonna trace like the Jesus figure all the way from like Hercules and like do a lineage and a genealogy of like Based. the reincarnations all the way to today. So don't worry. I got oh, is you. this like esoteric Je Jesusism? Is this like esoteric? Uh, you know. There's there's eh guys and there's esoteric Jesus. You know what I mean? Dude, I don't even know. That's a whole rabbit hole I haven't been down. I just I just thought it'd be funny <laughs> to like um try to like you know how like um uh how Augustus you know he has Virgil write the Aeneid. Uh, I wanted to do something like that, but for me, where I'm actually related to Alexander the Great, but like spiritually, Based. like spiritual reincarnation. It's very, it's very likely, very <laughs> likely by blood too. Yeah, it's don't, very possible. And I'm gonna I'm gonna fuck with the um the metaphysical doctrine so that like multiple people can have that spirit. So like I can like you know all 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 all, all the all my allies can can also have some cool lineage. But anyway, but no, I, mean, I told you, you say that it's uh arbitrarily, but it may be true. Who knows? Maybe yeah. maybe it is actually true. Who the fuck Partaking knows? Partaking the warrior spirit, my friend. Indeed. You know. Yeah. You who's listening. But um. I is a good place to wrap up for the podcast at least. I'm down to speak more offline for a yeah. bit if you're not busy. But um, absolutely, for you who are listening, it's not good enough for you. You must uh, you must ascend different levels to be able to converse with us. But until then, <laughs> until then, I just wanted to say one thing before I go. Uh, one piece of advice and one uh, homework, right? Some some take home exercise. So one piece of advice is it's never over until you give up and therefore if you never give up you never lose therefore you, you must always fight Indeed. two watch dr strangelove the movie from 1968 and understand thoroughly this uh, guy called general ripper someone who i spiritually am akin to in many different ways um and then on the other side maybe if i'm so fortunate and invited back on the podcast absolutely. maybe we can talk about it further does that work with you sir absolutely Ruh. all right um yeah thanks for watching if you watch this long um good on you i always say that if you watch this long you, you're one step closer to joining the inner circle anyway um <laughs> as always this is the warrior philosopher building the foundations of the warrior philosophy and we'll see you next time kill <laughs>